Good evening and welcome to Collaborating for Access. Today at our seventh in the Collaborating for Access series of webinars presented by the Chief Officers of State Library Association, or COSLA, the Digital Public Library of America, and Readers First, we'll look at ways libraries can drive discovery of and benefit from the inclusion of self-published titles in their collections. Highlights will include a look at the Indie Author Project, the Indie Author Catalog Selection in the Palace Marketplace, and insights from library leaders and independent authors themselves. Very excited about this, especially Especially as digital content becomes difficult to sustain from the from the larger publishers, especially for small libraries, this is a unique way that we might be able to create more sustainable and still outstanding content. We're going to begin today with Kelvin Watson. Kelvin is the executive director of the Las Vegas Clark County Library District. He oversees 25 branches spanning 8,000 square miles. A budget of 77 million, 700 employees, and a collection of 3.2 million items. Kelvin joined the library district from Broward County Libraries Division, where as the director, he managed 700 plus full time employees and a budget of more than 70 million. Kelvin, you've been a leader in this, especially featuring titles that the AOA Black Caucus put forward. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Michael. And uh, so happy to be a part of this discussion today and hear from the experts um, in talking about indie uh, authors and, and indie uh, publishing as it relates to libraries. Yeah, I've been a big proponent of independent authors going back to my uh, book distribution days at, at Ingram and have seen the um, just the explosion of independent authors and happy to support them as when I was the president of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association to offer a, an award to independent authors, um, mainly in fiction and poetry, and, give, and highlighting the uh, their works. I've also had the opportunity to do different projects, um, particularly at, at Broward County when I was the, the director there, and highlighting some independent authors as it pertained to more mainstream uh, authors and, and publishers. And so the you know, independent authors, especially with the um, with what we have, the nuances of now anyone could even write a book, including me. I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm the, uh, the best author, but um, I have the opportunity to tell my story, to tell a story. And, you know, I think that what we have is an opportunity to move beyond uh, the major uh, publishing houses and just, again, to hear all of these different voices, um, the diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. Um, that we all have, uh, regardless of our, our skin color, where we are, where we or where we're from, and libraries is the is the place I believe where we can um, continue to share the uh, share these publishing uh, these publishing aspects um, as part of our our mission. Um, we own the information space in my in my mind, and so no better place for. Uh, independent authors to be highlighted than in uh, in our libraries, and so I you know so I know I know take a few minutes. That's my that's my intro and what I wanted to say, and I know that hearing from um, the the the, uh, the authors and the uh, the publishers rather and the and the offerings that um, that that'll kind of fill in what what I've already uh, what I've already said. So thank you again i'm looking forward to listening learning and and sharing uh, more throughout the uh, throughout this process thank you so much kelvin uh um People joining us, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A section, and we'll be getting to those eventually. Um, uh, Kelvin, thank you for that challenge for librarians to ramp up their readers' advisory game. We should be the tastemakers. We should be the ones discovering these new authors. And what you've said, I think, is a great kickoff to hear about some of the offerings that might be available. And so we're going to introduce today Nash Steele and Miriam Tulalau. Um, Nash is the Operations Specialist for the Ebooks and Community Engagement Division of Lyricis. Her mission is to provide ebooks to public libraries, which she does through her work in the Indie Author Project and the Palace Project. And <clears throat> sorry, sorry about that. Um, we have uh, Miriam Tulalau, and uh, Miriam is 
the DPLA Curation Corps member, a New York Public Library veteran, and an adjunct library science instructor, and a senior library marketing manager at the Penguin Random House. Wow, what a career you've had, Miriam. Welcome both, please. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Michael, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to DPLA for hosting this webinar. And to all of the panelists here and all of you attending, um, I'm really excited to talk about how libraries can include and promote indie authors with the Indie Author Project. Um, so I wanted to start today with just a little run through of the Indie Author Project, um, some history and context in case you're not familiar. Um, so the Indie Author Project, or IAP, as you'll often see it abbreviated, is a publishing community made up of public libraries, authors, curators, and readers working together to connect library patrons with indie published books. Uh, this program came about after discussions surrounding the rising popularity of indie publishing and the obstacles indie authors were facing, as well as some of the challenges libraries were faced with in regards to lending models for many traditionally published ebooks. Uh, what we found th through these discussions is that while it's seemingly easier than ever for many indie authors to access commercial distribution options like Amazon, it can still be very difficult to get their indie ebooks into libraries and into the hands of interested and engaged library patrons. And on the flip side of this, with the seemingly hundreds of thousands of self-published books coming out every year, we learned how challenging it can be for libraries really of all sizes to find the bandwidth and resources to be able to identify and acquire high quality indie published titles, sometimes even by best, sell best selling indie authors from that kind of overwhelming wall of content. So the Indie Author Project was designed with both of these challenges in mind. Uh, one goal of this program was finding a way to be inclusive of all local writers and so we created local indie ebook collections that serve as a sort of archive for libraries and their communities. This allowed libraries to serve as a discovery tool for authors, providing them with a non-exclusive way to reach more readers through the library sphere. Another goal of the Indie Author Project was to identify and elevate the top submissions of the program, which we do with the help of industry curation partners and library editorial boards. These high quality indie ebooks are added to the growing curated Indie Author Project Select commercial collections, which are available to libraries across the US and Canada on all major library e lending platforms. These commercial collections help strengthen the library's relationships with their local writing communities, providing patrons with easy access to new and diverse literary voices and gives authors further opportunities for growth through added exposure and paid royalties. One of the most exciting things about the IAP Select commercial collections is that all of the titles are available in an unlimited simultaneous use model, which means no holds or wait times for patrons. Libraries can purchase perpetual or subscription licenses of bundles ranging in size from 25 to 1,000 eBooks. There's also a growing audiobook collection available in the same unlimited sim use model. Having these two types of collections allows the program and participating libraries to be inclusive and supportive of all types of indie authors, while also being able to confidently feature and promote the best submissions with the IAP Select commercial collections. And working so closely with the Palace Project means that it's easy for us to curate these collections and tailor them to a specific library's needs. Uh, we'll often see libraries requesting bundles, for example, featuring all of the titles from local authors in their region, or a selection of the collection's top circulating titles, or even adding the most recently published titles. Uh, we also hold an annual Indie Author Project contest where we find the best books across seven different genres. And from those winners, choose one author each year to be named the Indie Author of the Year. We actually have the 2023 Indie Author of the Year, Jamie Fairley, here with us on the webinar today, and she'll be speaking in just a little bit. Um, so another option for libraries to curate these bundles is by award winners. And just to note, two of Jamie's books, Oil and Dust and Graphite and Turbulence, are currently included in that collection. 
We also have resources on IndieAuthorProject.com on how libraries can best market these titles to their patrons to drive discoverability. And we're always happy to help create curated collections as well. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, feel free to reach out to info at thepalaceproject.org or check out IndieAuthorProject.com. Um, and I see there are some of the links posted in the chat. So definitely check those out. All right, thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's a real privilege to serve on DPLA's Curation Corps alongside esteemed librarian colleagues, Jill Egan and Sarah Cooperman. Our work is purposeful. We support libraries that are seeking to enhance and diversify their ebook collections, as well as broaden their readership for independently published books. Our group reads and reviews hundreds of the popular self-published titles um, uh, across all genres, including romance, mystery, science fiction, and fantasy for all age groups children, teens, and adults. We consider each work's appeal factors, including character, style, pacing, um, and setting, and select and share these self-published gems in curated collections in the Palace Marketplace. We place a strong emphasis on supporting pleasure reading and identifying quality fiction and highlighting books written by diverse and underrepresented voices. We aim to save the time of the collection development librarians across library land, helping to guide their purchasing decisions by offering a range of titles that would serve the interests of all people that community libraries serve. And keeping the needs of programming librarians in mind, we also try to identify titles that are strong picks for book clubs, whether they're adult or teen book clubs, and um, author events. Um, some of our team's favorite titles include um, two uh, fast-paced young adult fantasies, uh, Shadow Thief by Pakistani author Intasar Kanani, which features a very strong female lead with magical powers, and The Lost Expedition, an um, arresting supernatural tale by Douglas Smith. Uh, for adult Readers of literary fiction, we highly recommend The Art of Her Life by Cynthia Newberry Martin. This is a lyrical and tenderly told novel about a woman who's grappling with multiple responsibilities from parenting to work and finds solace in the art and the words of Henri Matisse. Mystery fans, especially uh, readers of gentle crime fiction, uh, will also surely enjoy the culinary cozy Knee Deep in Dough by Catherine Bruins, the author of the popular Cookies and Chance mystery series, and also Tayora Moody's A Spicy Predicament, which features honeymooner Eugenia Patterson Jones dealing with a murderous mishap. We're so fortunate to have Tayora uh, as part of this program today. So, um, so we encourage you to uh, browse the Indie Catalog on the Par Palace Marketplace for more reading recommendations. Um, all of these titles are available on the perpetual one at a time license model. And in closing, on behalf of the entire Curation Corps, thank you all for that you do in the area of promoting independent authors and sharing your passions for books and readings across uh, communities. Well, well, thank you so much, both Nash and Miriam. And Miriam, I've just become a fan. That's some amazing book talking you do there. I can see why Penguin Random House wants you. Um, so the other day, my library is undergoing a strategic planning process and we hired a consultant. The other day, the consultant came to the library, was talking to staff and said, well, how about those ravens? And everybody looked at her and said, what are you talking about? It turns out there's this team called the Baltimore Ravens, which are of interest to librarians primarily because their name comes from Edgar Allan Poe's connection to Baltimore, who are playing in some sort of football game. Um, everybody just 
what's this? Now, if she had talked about authors, she would have gotten a lot different response. Authors are, for most librarians, our heroes. We follow their career. We read their new books. We're excited to meet them. So I'm really happy today to introduce two self-published authors, and Tayora Moody and Jamie Fairley. And Tayora is the author of Soul Searching Mysteries and Suspense. And that includes cozy mystery, detective fiction, police procedurals, and romantic suspense under the Christian fiction genre. And she's been independently publishing books for over a decade. And we also have Jamie Fairley. Jamie was chosen to 2023 Indie Author of the Year by the Indie Author Project. She's a Japanese American writer, urban planner and hobby collector from Washington. She serves her life with a husband, a trio of well-mannered horses, a dubiously behaved parrot, and one very neurotic dog. Welcome both, so please take it away. Awesome, thank you for having me today. Um, it's really delightful for me to talk in front of librarians because I was that young bookworm who lived down the street from a library. So I was at the library probably every week, walking back and forth with a stack of books. At that time, I didn't know that I would actually be an author myself, like 20, 30 years later, <laughs> not until my age. But I enjoy the fact that I also can have my books in front of people who go to the library, whether they go to the library physically, or they go to Overdrive or Hoopla or Palace Marketplace to grab those books, um, it brings a lot of joy to me, just as much as my commercial people, because I remember being that young girl um, who was ferocious about reading and especially reading mysteries. So it's interesting how I would come back and forth to the library with all these different authors, like Mary Higgins Clark, and then those authors were later on influenced how I write, how I dive into writing cozy mysteries, are also diving into writing just a private detective series. So I really appreciate the opportunity. And I know a lot of independent authors, they are always looking for ways to get their work out. And I, I also try to remind them too, the best way is to get it in front of people who love to be in the library and love to check out books. Yeah, thank you so much, Jamie. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie Fairley, an independent author um, in the today rainy Pacific Northwest. I write creative nonfiction, short fiction in a variety of genres and fantasy novels for both middle grade and adult audiences. Um, Oil and Dust is my debut novel. I like to describe it as a cozy post-apocalyptic fantasy uh, featuring art-based magic. It's the first um, in my Elemental Artist series, there's planned four books. Three of them are out now, and I am working on the fourth and final book currently. Um, I, I wrote the book because I attended the 2017 Women's March. And at the time, the people who came together in Seattle were pretty worried about the future. Things were changing. Um, People were very unsure about what was going to happen next. And despite the overall anxiety, the, the vibe of the crowd was so warm and kind and loving. And it made me really hopeful for the future that even if everything fell apart, we would be OK. You know, people, there are good people everywhere and people can work together collaborative, collaboratively to solve a lot of problems. So um, I started thinking about what what would the world be like? You know, if if we kind of society crumbled and we went into a world where we didn't necessarily all have to think about power and money and politics and, you know, the failings or benefits of government. And so um, I set my book in a post-technology world a couple hundred years in the future, but the communities there, this is a, a hopeful, happy place. And the communities there are focused on collaboration and connection. And um, creativity is valued and kind of at the top of the, the social totem pole there. Um, books like mine are admittedly a little hard to market. They don't fit neatly into any one genre. And I think that's true for a lot of indie books. 
Um, indie authors also don't necessarily have the skills to network and find ways to market their books without a lot of marketing skill in their background. Um, so partners like the Indie Author Project are really vital for helping us gain exposure, um, helping us reach out to places like libraries and get in front of librarians without having to go knocking on all the doors. Um, and through libraries, we gain readers. We we see the impact of our books and um, it's it's so exciting when a customer or a, a reader, a library customer reaches out and says, hey, I found your books because they were in my local library and you know they, they join author newsletters and they start cheering us on and they um, sometimes repeatedly ask for updates on when that next book is coming, but it's 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 part of why we do this. So I'm personally also a huge consumer of digital content. I belong to two of my local library systems and um, I use them for research, for entertainment, for craft books, for, um, I, I read a lot of fiction, both in audiobook and ebook, and it, it just opens up so much for me. I, I love the curated lists that our local libraries will put together, you know, for almost every month, they will have um, some kind of a tie to like, this is Black History Month. And so a lot of books that they're featuring right now are either about or written by Black authors. And I love that. So thank you so much for including the diverse voices of the author community in your libraries. Um, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Um, Toyora, uh, by popular demand, why don't you tell us more about some of your books? Um, sure. So um, I write cozy mysteries and police procedurals, as well as private investigation. So pretty much a range of mysteries. My most popular with the libraries are probably my Eugenia Patterson mysteries. It is set in a fictional neighborhood in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and the amateur sleuth, the star of that series, is Eugenia Patterson. She's a retired school teacher, a grandmother, and for some reason, after she retired, she decided to get to the business of being an amateur sleuth. So I'm about going into book number seven. Uh, so you'll you'll find with my books, I love to write series. I love to read series. <laughs> so. Um, and I just started a new cozy mystery series, which is a spinoff of that one called the Joss Miller mystery. So it's a younger amateur sleuth. Um, I think you'll find with most of my uh, books, there's a, a cast of characters that you get to know and they uh, travel through each of those books and you get to know families and friends. And I hope most readers tell me they feel like they're a part of the, the story. So those are my books. Oh, great. And Micah, who, who's with us today, actually featured one of your books in a blog post today called A Spicy Predicament. Um, so Eugenia Patterson Jones and her husband Amos Jones finally head out for the long-awaited honeymoon in Music City. As part of a surprise, Eugenia is treated to a concert starring one of her favorite singers. Cinnamon Waters, also a childhood friend, invites Eugenia and Amos backstage. Behind the glints and music, tension brews, and Eugenie will find out if someone wants to harm Sidibman. With one mishap after the other, the couple's romantic getaway takes a backseat to trying to save her friend's life. So if you want to know more, you got to get the book. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, so uh, we're going to return back to Kelvin for just a couple of final words, and then we're going to go ahead and, and our Q&A session, and I hope the audience will have some questions. Uh, I, I do like to privilege those, but but I've got a number of questions I'd like to ask just in case nobody else has any. So um, Kelvin, um, basically, uh, any final words from you about uh, why it's important that we are in this space? Well, based on, you know, what Nash and Miriam and Tiara and Jamie had to share, and certainly where I, where I started the conversation, and they highlighted certainly the importance of not only the projects that are out there that focus on independent uh, authors and, and publishers um, in regards to supporting libraries and the libraries customers and, and, and patrons that we serve, but also hearing from the, the self-published authors themselves and having the opportunity to be 
in front of the library customers when historically we know that that was not the case with the the large publishers and even um, some of the bookstores not making these resources available. And so those would be my last words and that libraries, um, again, it's part of what we, what we do. It's part of our mission to make sure that all voices are heard regardless of, you know, where, where, where it's coming from. All right, well, well, thank you so much, Kelvin. I appreciate that. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's again a way that we can maybe get some more sustainable content on, on a high quality. So I'm looking to see if we have any questions here. And sure, I am. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. I don't see any open questions right now. Um, please, uh, audience, if you have questions, either there or in the chat, whichever you'd like. So I'll go ahead and just, just start with a couple here. Um, how are titles chosen for the Curation core in the Indie Author Project? What brings those books forward? And this, I'm hoping everybody can open their mic now. Let's just go ahead and have this be a general conversation with everybody. I can kind of kick things off um, on the Indie Author Project side of things. Uh, we're looking for, um, you know, a previous award winners, um, authors that are already established um, and already have a little bit of a writing career going, but also emerging authors um, like Jamie, who won with her debut novel. Um, so we're looking for all different kinds of genres and ages. Um, and we help to um, identify those books that are selected with our librarian editorial boards um, and our other industry partners like Library Journal. And the curation core uh, is is essentially looking for genres and um, that support, you know, reading pleasure uh, for the public for all age groups. We know in public libraries there are many many romance readers, mystery readers, and fans of sci-fi, um, and we know that these are books that are enjoyed by um, in individual groups of readers, but also um, uh, books that are discussed and potentially discussable in book clubs, as well as um, an opportunity for author events. So really keeping uh, community uh, diversity, uh, uh, providing a range of uh, genres uh, for readers to enjoy. Are there ways that authors can bring their work to your attention? We are, our team is largely um, identifying titles that are currently uh, living in um, the palace um, marketplace and uh, and seeking out titles based on our, our strengths in terms of reviewers uh, by genre. Okay. We're actually um, getting ready to kick off our next round of annual Indie Author Project contests. So that's a great way for authors to get in front of the Indie Author Project team. Um, submissions will open on April 1st, and we're changing up the format a little bit. So we're picking winners based on genre, but I would encourage any authors to apply to that. Yeah, okay. So I, uh, we have a question coming in from Kathleen Woods. Kathleen, thank you. Can an indie press or university press submit an indie book on behalf of the author if the press owns the rights? And also, does publication date or recency matter in this? Um, for the Indie Author Project, we allow um, books from small independent presses um, it's a little bit of a gray area. Typically, the author has to still retain the rights of their book to participate. Um, but if they do retain the rights and they are part of a small independent press, they're able to um, enter their book into the Indie Author Project. And there's um, no uh, limits on publication dates. So you can publish a book that's 50 years old or one that you just wrote yesterday. Um, we'll accept anything. Okay. Um, I have a 
question from Latanya Hughes. Do you ever look for indie authors through pitch competitions? And I don't know what a pitch competition is. So, um, uh, so let's go ahead and, and see there. I'm actually not sure what a pitch competition. Okay. <laughs> sorry um, about that. Sorry, Latanya, we're 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 stumped here. Um, uh, so I'll move on, but maybe try to look up definition of pitch competition uh, while I'm about it. Um, Willis Smith has: Have there been authors who, through the indie author pro, uh, publishing project, became well known or signed with a major book publishing company? To, uh, you know, kind of a career boost, and then moving into that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know we've had a few different examples of authors who have become really successful after um, entering the Indie Author Project. One of the people I can think of off the top of my head is Ryan Walker. He was our first um, inaugural Indie Author of the Year. He had published, I think, something like 17 different books of poetry, short stories, and fiction, um, and hadn't had much success with it and decided to enter into the Indie Author Project. So he won our regional contest and then went on to become the Indie Author of the Year, which really just opened up a whole world of opportunities for him. Um, he's written several books since then that have sold widely. Um, he's produced audiobooks and also had um, other opportunities like mentoring, teaching about writing. Um, I think he's helping to write he was approached by a video game company and is helping to write the story of the video game. So it's really just opened up so many opportunities for him and um, has led to a lot of success and exposure that I think he really wasn't expecting. So that was, he's an exciting example. I'd like to return to possibly talking about some of the barriers uh, for fostering greater discovery of, of new authors by librarians and how we might overcome those barriers. And certainly both your, your projects are an important part of that. But let's uh, turn back to the authors for just a second. And I've got a few questions for you. Um, librarians, when we're looking at um, licensing materials are often, we there's a movement to try to start buying uh, the rights to, to digital books the same way we would buy um, a print book. Um, you know, we, we're looking for like a print equivalency. We don't want to be paying so much for digital. That could be a problem for an author. I mean, so you've sold once or you've licensed once and all these people are reading it instead of buying it. What would you think are, are fair terms that you'd like to see libraries offer authors? At this point in your career, is it more important just to just to get it out there because libraries can help with discovery? Um, well, I'll speak for myself. I think for libraries, it's more important for me to continuously get more readers. So it may be at some point a reader may decide they want to purchase and have um, in their own ebook reader or on their shelves. Um, you know, that's a possibility that could happen. So I'm okay with just having more people exposed to my books. So, yeah. I feel exactly the same way. Um, like I said, I check out a lot of books from the library and my favorites, I usually end up buying print copies, but the it's a great way to just see kind of what's out there and test a new author that you hadn't heard of before just to see if you kind of vibe with their voice and what they have to say. So I I have no problems at all with the idea of multiple people reading the single copy that was purchased. Well, uh, just so you know, to clarify what can be a misunderstanding, I, I once did a an interview um, with NPR talking about this, and they had an author on who said, libraries are giving away books for free. No, we're not. We, I promise we pay very nicely to get the rights to these. And, and so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, we, you know, we want to be fair to authors. We can't live without authors in libraries. So it's not that we're 
here in, in digital, you know, library digital land, looking not to create a market. That's our aim is to try to drive more uh, sales to people. And there is a substantial overlap between people who check out library books and then buy them too. So, um, so, um, Michael, can I just jump in on that? Sure, please do. Point? Yeah, I know I'm not, not technically on the agenda, but just to add to that, I think, you know, I think we've seen the sentiments that were expressed by these two authors, you know, reflected in the other terms associated with self-published titles. And it really does, I think, present a win-win for libraries and authors, because basically, you know, the terms are really reasonable. Um, as was mentioned by Miriam, all of the indie selections are available perpetually. So um, not technically ownership, but that's something we could potentially return to and explore as we continue to develop that model. It's, it's already available to libraries sort of indefinitely on a one user at a time basis. And the books are generally, you know, really reasonable. I haven't seen any that are over 20. Most of them are under $10 for that. So it's a very reasonable price. Uh, you know, the IAP collection um, is also very reasonably priced and available on some really great models, including, as Nash said, the simultaneous use, which can also be perpetual access simultaneous use. So really uh, models that allow libraries to maximize access and discovery. So just wanted to chime in to highlight. Oh, no, please. Yeah. Uh, as I say, I, I want this to be an open conversation and anybody who has something to say, please, uh, please do. Um, so uh, open a, a kind of little can of worms here, but we do have a, an 800 pound gorilla in the room and that is um, AI generated titles. Um, is that something that as authors you're concerned about? Um, and do you do you think that it's going to in some ways um, make the market more difficult? I'm sure I can speak on that. So just say, you know, I'm kind of a techie. Um, my background is web development. So I have looked into AI. I have tried all the models, chat, GPT, Bard, Claude. Um, I always, and I actually just did a webinar about this a few months ago. So I always tell um, authors, AI generation is something to use as a tool. So it's definitely something that's great as a brainstorming experiment because being an author is a very lonely <laughs> um, a thing to do sometimes. You're just in your head with characters. So I think if you have the wrong people, some of them may use it the wrong way, but I think authors shouldn't be afraid to use the tools to help with brainstorming more plots, even if it's just coming up with a different name. And when you think about it, AI is, has already been used in a lot of tools we already use like Microsoft Word. <laughs> Microsoft Word is telling you that word is spelled wrong or it's trying to guide you into how to use the proper English term or put a comma there. So it's kind of already in things that we already use. I just think um, not be afraid of it. Just know it's just another tool. So that's what I tell my author friends and people that I work with. Great. Anything there, Jamie, or... Yeah, I would completely agree. Um, notebook is for every reader. And so there will be readers for the AI titles, but doubling down on being human, on being able and willing to share kind of your authentic story, who you are and what you bring to the page is a big part of writing stories and being a storyteller. Um, it, you know, a lot of us write we write solo, but we write to connect with people. And that's something that AI doesn't do and kind of can't do, but it is a really useful tool. Um, I also use AI in a lot of kind of writing adjacent things. Um, I'm a, a big lover of Pro Writing Aid, which is a kind of a grammar checker on steroids. Um, I've used Marlowe, which is an AI tool to kind of help you look at your, um, like your overused words or cliches that you use too much. And I use it as part of my editing process. And then there's another um, developmental editing tool called Fictionary that I've used in the past for helping make sure that my story beats and plots are kind of on track. Um, it's great for pulling out all your character names and making sure that you don't have too many characters starting with the letter C, things like that. But 
as far as generating full stories, no, I'm not worried about it. Oh, great. Thank you so much for for giving us more of a writerly insight on this. Um, you know, we're we're hearing um concerns about it being expressed and and there's so many ai generated books on amazon now and and so on and so forth and it's good to hear that it's a tool but the writer's heart is still the one the writer's mind the writer's creativity is still what's going to make a book for us um uh, Tayore, you 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 mentioned that writing is a lonely thing and and jamie you said we write alone but trying to connect with people could you just talk a little bit more about why you write you know, it's it's not an easy thing to get published. It's not an easy thing to move into that and and to make a living at it. So, why why do you do this? Oh, uh, well, probably this will probably be a really weird way to say it, but these characters just show up in your head. Now, <laughs> no, I, I write because I just generally love the art of storytelling. I've been reading since an early age. Always admire how um, you can bring something out of the blue pull it together after a couple of months and it's like an actual story from beginning to end people with almost they feel like real lives um, so I just enjoy the art of storytelling and that's why I do it and I appreciate when people jump into my stories and especially because I write mysteries and I love you know putting in those red herrings and see if people actually guess who it is by the end of the book so that just brings joy to my heart if they don't guess it. <laughs> so that's what I love about it. Thank you. Uh, Jamie. There is, um, I, I don't know how you can be a reader and not want to create a story at some point yourself. Um, I I tried for a long time, many, many times, and it it took kind of being in the right mental space and having the right amount of creative time to actually get one done but once you do it it's 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 just it's fun it's challenging it's work it can break your heart um it's you know some days you want to tear your hair out and then some days you walk around and you see your world instead of the real world in front of you and you can imagine exactly what's going on in your character's life so um there's the, the freedom of creative expression, you know, in your stories, you can make anything happen. I love fantasy because I'm always wanting to kind of explore in a non-threatening um, way, you know, what, what would happen if this occurred? And it's, it's um, the, 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 the ability to just find out kind of what you're thinking about, but in a completely different way is, it's magical. Oh, thank you both so much. Uh, Kelvin, you've put something in the chat, a link in the chat. Could you just tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, the um, I was responding to the question regarding the pitch contest. Um, so I would call this sort of like a pitch contest. So when I when the um, Indie Arthur Project started more or less at, at Biblio, um, no, Biblio Labs, um, we partnered with them, the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, as I mentioned earlier, to offer the first ebook uh, library award. And we, two categories were uh, fiction and poetry. And I, I know there was a question earlier about um, had anyone gone on to be um, a, you know, work with major uh, publishing houses. So there's, I know that Rand was mentioned. I actually know Rand. Uh, as well, um, because he was also the BCLA winner. But then there was another author, and I can't think of her name, so I apologize. But I, I tried to research it. But she actually got a five-book deal with a major publisher after she won the um, the the uh, BCLA ebook award. And so what I just posted is some information regarding the contest, and it's got the deadlines, and it's been going on that project, um, and and um, ebook award has been going on since for about seven years now that's been about seven years yeah well latanya i hope that helps to answer your question um that you posed earlier in the chat and thank you so much for that um so uh, micah has posted in the chat uh information about the 
summit that's going to be coming up before PLA in Columbus, Ohio in April. It'll be on April 2nd. And it's a convening of libraries and independent publishers. It's hosted by DPLA and the Independent Publishers Caucus, also by Ingram and Publishers Weekly. And so we're going to be having um, conversations about precisely what we're talking about today. How could we discover more content in libraries for publishers? What are the opportunities in libraries? What are librarians looking for when they select? What are librarians looking for to provide digital? Um, how can you get your books into libraries more? And the, the idea in some ways is to foster greater diversity of titles, but as we've said before, just ways that especially digital can be made more sustainable while still having great content and discovering new voices. So it's gonna be all about that. There is a, a link in the chat. And if you're going to be at PLA uh, or just happen to be in Columbus, Ohio, um, please come on out because it's not officially connected to PLA. Um, and Nash notes that submission to the BC uh, ALA contests are open until February 29th. So if you're an author out there and qualify, please uh, get your, your submission in. Um, Shanita asks, how are these programs different from submitting through Rakuten, Kobo uh, to OverDrive? Anybody want to take that question on? I mean, I could kick us off and then maybe Nash or Miriam would add more. I would say, you know, um, submitting to OverDrive is a great way to make your book available to libraries. Lots of libraries use OverDrive. Um, the Palace Marketplace is a nonprofit alternative uh, that we think gives libraries a little more control over their collection, better patron privacy, and the ability to merge different kinds of content. So Palace libraries can take content they purchase from OverDrive and from other sources, including Palace and lots of others, Bibliolabs, et cetera, put all in one place. Um, I would say in particular, what you've heard about today in the IAP, you know, in the author project and the DPLA selections are, you know, a kind of very carefully hand curated subset. You know, we know that there are lots of wonderful self-published books out there, um, but there's a lot, right? So just on the indie catalog on the Palace Marketplace, it's almost half a million titles. And we know that selectors of libraries don't have the bandwidth to go through those and try to figure out which ones make sense to add to their collections and align with their collection development priorities. So both IAP and the DPLA selections give that process a jump start by having librarians who you can trust with lots of experience um, making those decisions, uh, really just bubbling up some of the gems. We know that we're not finding everything. I'm sure there's tons of other great books that we haven't found yet, um, but this is at least a, a small subset that you can really count on being super high quality and something that your readers will enjoy as a librarian. So I guess to loop back to your question, you know, if you submit your title um, to OverDrive, that puts it in the OverDrive catalog. But again, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of self-published titles. You know, these are a special subset that we're trying to bubble up. I think part of our goal is to have libraries uh, get more interested in self-published and indie titles and hopefully eventually go deeper into the catalog on their own, um, but at least to give them kind of a jumping off point of uh, a collection they can really rely on to be something they're proud to put in their library. I hope that helps. Anything you want to add, um, Nash or, or Miriam? I th would be remiss if I didn't um, talk about the opportunity for libraries to become publishers. Um, so actually my my little library, St. Mary's County Library in Maryland worked on this and we have some books that are in the DPLA um, catalog. Um, we own the copyright to them. They were just little self-published things that we had, or in one case, it was a community uh, group that got together and, and published a history of um, the segregated schools in Southern Maryland and how we work to uh, integrate those and, and what they were like. And it's just fascinating. It's kind of local reading. And, and so we approached DPLA and said, you know, how do we get these into our, um, our, our palace? 
app and so they were able to do that um so libraries i think have a role especially with local authors in promoting titles as well as perhaps looking through more traditional or even independent um, publishing so i think it's something that libraries really need to do to create lots of local interest in some of their collections um do we have any more questions here Well, I, I think that getting, Michael, what you were just saying about getting reviews of these titles in, about getting eyes on so that librarians going to discover the matter is really going to be the key to this. So I'd like to thank you all for your work in moving forward with that and helping librarians to discover this kind of thing. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it on over to uh, Jeremy Johansson from COSLA to take us out. Excellent, thank you so much, Michael. And thank you to everyone today. I wanna extend our thanks to Kelvin and Nash and Miriam, uh, Tora, Tora uh, and Jamie. Uh, and also to give my thanks to my partners in crime, uh, the, the dulcet tone, Mike uh, Blackwell, as well as <laughs> Micah and Kat, thank you all. Um, I want to, I'm just seeing there uh, dropped in the chat, uh, the DPLA uh, email and uh, other contact information. We wanna hear from you all. What would you like us to be talking about next relative to ebook access uh, so that we can continue this uh, fantastic series? So uh, please reach out and let us know uh, what directions we should uh, point the ship. I look forward to seeing you all again on the next in this ongoing series of Collaborating Access, a partnership between the Digital Public Library of America, Readers First, and the Chief Officers of State Library Agencies. Thanks, everybody. And just one final word, Tiora and Jamie, thank you so much for joining us today and good luck in your writing careers. I am going to be going to find some of your works and make sure that I become a more informed reader. You've done a great, uh, great job talking about your, your books and I look forward to reading them. Thank you so much, everybody.